Okay, so today, guys, we've got um, Dave Crossland on the podcast. Um, you may have heard of Dave. He did this crazy transformation and went up to £400, which is unbelievable. So we've been wanting to get him on for a while. Um, so we'll have a good chat about his journey, let him tell you exactly what he did, his approach, and then we can talk about what I think needs to be talked about at the moment with the, the gear situation being really out of hand within the sport, particularly bodybuilding, but many other sports. So anyway, without further ado, how are you doing, Dave? I'm not bad, mate. I'm not bad. Uh, plodding along. Um, I suppose I ought to sort of go through my journey. I'll do it in brief, otherwise I'll be here all fucking day. Yeah, no um, Fat kid. Always fat kid. Played rugby at school. Still a fat kid. Got fed up of being a fat kid and not being strong for being a fat kid. Uh, so decided I'd start working out with a bit of weights when I was around 15. Uh, and it was just a set of dumbbells in the garage underneath. Well, it was a basement, actually. The house was, like, built into a hillside, so we had a walking basement underneath, walking cellar, whatever you want to call it. Started messing around with a pair of dumbbells down there. Uh, found I enjoyed it. Joined the gym. Uh, and I started off uh, Bob Sweeney's Olympic Fitness in Huddersfield. Right. Then I went to... And I used to work in a, uh, a chip shop on a Saturday, and then I'd go train. And they used to make me leave my trainers outside because they stung that bad because I was studying fish water all day long. Um, and then I just, I don't know, I just had some weird natural affinity to training hard. I just i just went to it like a fish in water. I love training hard. If I wasn't hurting and screaming and crying, I didn't feel like I'd done anything. Um, I then moved to Cambridge Road Baths in Huddersfield and was lucky enough to bump into Deaf and Mute Bob, as he was known. And a guy called uh, Dave Towers, who was married to Barbara Towers, who was uh, a female heavyweight. I think Barbara got a pro card as well. Uh, yeah. But, I mean, Dave and Bob were decent bodybuilders, uh, but Barbara was exceptional. Um, so I got a little bit of a guidance there. And then a gym opened called Maloney's. Um, and I went up there. And that was the place to be, really. Um, and we had... I ended up working behind the counter at 16, finished school at 16, wasn't doing anything for a while. So I started working behind the counter at Maloney's. Um, and as a result of that, met Ian Harrison, um, met Mike Quinn. Um, at the time, met a lot of the, the local top guys as well. So people like Bob Kirk. And there was also a guy there called Billy Payne. Now, uh, Billy Payne was the, the new promise, so to speak, in bodybuilding. Dorian had already made his mark. Dorian was already Mr. Olympia. And Billy was going to be the next big thing. Uh, Billy used to train with Dorian. And at 16, Billy became my training partner. Or I became his training partner. So I got a baptism of fire, really. I mean, you know, from the early days, all I knew was to train hard. I didn't know any different. And then I started training with Kev Taylor and Mary Ann Gay. Kev was three-time British champion, middleweight and lightweight. Uh, they were also couples champion, and Mary was pro, uh, IFBB pro. Um, and both of them were a little bit nutty when it came to training in the gym. Um, Mary was a complete, she was an extremely hard taskmaster, let, let me put it that way. So I mistook weight for size. And by sort of 18, I was 19 stone. Sorry, no, I wasn't. I was 23 and a half stone. I apologize. Um, I was, for a natural young lad, I mean, I was strong. I was low pressing a thousand pounds for sets. I wasn't pissing about, but I was a fat fuck. And I mean a fat fuck. Um, and I decided I was going to compete in uh, what was the AMB, Amateur Natural Bodybuilders. I mean, they no, yeah, don't exist anymore. And so I started dieting Easter Monday at 23 and a half stone, and I stepped on stage at 14 stone three in October. <laughs> And I was dead. <laughs> My last two weeks of diet were castellan and cabbage. That was it. <laughs> because I'd have to lose so much weight and diet so hard that when it got to the end, it just wasn't coming off unless I was being extreme. And then after the show, I had no choice but to continue with the diet because I just couldn't eat junk food. It just, I just threw up. I just, just threw it straight back out again. Um, and up to that point, I'd been, I wasn't, Again, steroids in a sense. I knew they existed. Obviously, I trained with guys that used them and 
And then I, obviously I was privy to a lot of steroid talk working behind a counter at the gym. But I, uh, it wasn't for me. Uh, and everybody had respected that. And then I was just like, this natural lark really just doesn't have anywhere to go. I mean, natural federations at that time were at local level. They didn't really do anything internationally. There was just no further to go. Um, and it was just like, well, it's a dead end, is this? If I want to go further, I've got to sort of step into what the big boys do. So I went on gear. Um, I think I was about 19 stone of fat when I started, because after the show, I just didn't train. I was fucked. So burnt out from doing the show, I just didn't train at all. I just didn't do anything. Um, so at 19 stone of chub, I'd come home from uni. I had the summer. I was working the doors um, in Halifax, and then I was working as a postman in the morning. So I had a very short amount of sleep, but then I used to get a sleep in the afternoon for a few hours as well. And I was doing a shitload of cardio. And at the end of that summer, so the end of that 10 weeks, um, I was 19 stone with abs. I grew like a fucking weed. <laughs> but I grew like a weed because I'd always trained out. Yeah. Uh, and so I went back to uni and everyone was like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> you know, a completely different person turned up. <laughs> I carried on going. And I got up to about 23, around 23, 24. I wasn't lean, but I was I was what would be classed as reasonable off-season condition. I still did cardio, and, and I looked in reasonable nick. And, and at that point, I had my sights on going pro. I mean, that was all I wanted. That was all I dreamed of. That was what I planned to do. Uh, Billy Payne, we opened the gym in Halifax. Dorian came up to open it. Kevin Mary took me over. Kevin introduced me to Dorian. That was a two-word conversation. Uh, but then Dorian did apparently say to Kev that I was dieting for the lead show, the lead qualifier at the time, and he did apparently say if I could get into condition, then if Kev brought me down to Birmingham, Dorian would turn me pro. Right. Now, I, at that point, that was my dreams come true. I was absolutely fucking buzzing. Whether that conversation actually happened or Kev was just bullshitting me because he wanted to motivate me, I don't know, because he wouldn't surprise me with Kev. He was full of weird tricks like that. But anyway, I went back into the gym and I'd had a niggle in my left back for weeks. But it used to warm out, so I wasn't overly concerned. You know, you're like 23, full of fucking gear. You're, you're 10 men, you know what I mean? You're, you're, you're indestructible. Um, and bear in mind, I've not gone over a gram and a half at this point ever. Most of my cycles were around a gram. Yeah. Um, so start flying because I used to pre-exhaust because I had a lot of problems with pec engagement. So I used to always fly before I pressed on pecs. And I think it was the 120 or 130 pound dumbbells, and I was on the incline, and it was about a seven for eight for it. Went really wide, and my left arm just kept going. Uh, massive Velcro separating noise. Uh, I mean. People around me heard it. You know, it wasn't just something I heard in my head. It was very loud. And I'm still on the incline bench holding a dumbbell, which is on the floor on the left side. Wow. Uh, I knew what I'd done straight away. I knew I'd torn it. Um, went to A&E. Obviously, not much done at that point, but got an ultrasound within a couple of days. Uh, and both pecs of the both attachments of the major pec had been pulled out of the arm. And the attachments down the side of the ribs had gone. Uh, effectively, my major pec had nearly lifted completely off everything and was nearly just floating. It was only just hanging in by a few bits at the top. All down here was torn off, uh, as well as those two major attachments. Ouch. Went to see a surgeon, and bear in mind, this is 1995. So uh, Bodybuilding wasn't what it is now, and bodybuilders weren't what it was is now. And the NHS just, well, the surgeon said he's not going to do it. Right. Um, I did try and continue training to a degree, and obviously there's no way I was doing any more damage because it wasn't fucking attached anymore. So it was just sore, very sore. Um, but I'd lost. It destroyed, to me, any chance of ever doing anything within bodybuilding. So it became very much like, what's the point? Yeah. Uh, I very quickly drifted away. Uh, I was busy with my own company anyway, so it was easy to get distracted into that. Uh, and it wasn't long before I was 24, 25 stone of fat. Right. Um, and I stayed in that state for probably 12 years. 
ended up in a very unhappy relationship, ended up in a lot of trouble with the old bill, that evasion of all things. Uh, ran away to Spain, then buggered off to Canada, then got caught, got sent back. And when I got sent to prison, um, it was like, you know, sort your life out time in, in lots of different aspects, both relationship and personal and physique and everything. So I started dieting in prison. Uh, I was probably a year before I got any real consistent time in a gym. Uh, and by the time I came out, I was 19 stone. I was starting to show a bit of abs. Um, and I didn't, for a natural, you know, I, I didn't have a bad physique at that point. Obviously, I wasn't nowhere near contest shape, but I was starting to look all right. And then I did, well, probably six months natural on the out before I did my first cycle. And within two cycles, I was 200, sorry, three, 350 ish. Uh, and I was thinking of going into strongman. So I was doing a lot of high volume, heavy squat work and stuff like that. But the one thing I've never had is a good pull off the floor. It's always been shit. I have short legs, a very long torso and pretty short arms. Uh, I'm incredibly strong overhead. I'd match anyone at the time overhead, but I could not get shit off the floor. Um, the distance between my hip and my shoulders is just too great, which means that effectively I end up doing a stiff leg deadlift and trying to get it up. I just never got on with deadlift at all. And I've got very fat palms and very short fingers, which doesn't help to a strong grip either. Yeah. Struggled with thick bars. And I suppose really it just wasn't me. It wasn't what I was really into. And then I opened a gym in uh, Carlisle. It was effectively an existing gym that uh, owners had gone bust, and I did a deal with a landlord where I could take it over and restart the business. And I got, um, who came up now? Sean da Davis came up, Andy Bolton came up, um, Alvin Small, Mark Felix. And we had a bit of an open day, a bit of a strength competition, got some sponsorship, got some prize money together. And Alvin just said, why don't you compete? And I started listing off a big, long list of, well, I've got a torn peck, I've got this, but I've got that. And by that time, I have a couple of quad tears, a bicep tear in each arm, and a few other bits and bats. Uh, and he just sort of said, well, obviously, you just never wanted it enough, did you? And I was going to get very defensive, and I just sat there and thought, no, you're fucking right, actually. I didn't. Anyway, he sort of bullied me into competing again. So I started dieting, and it was a long time, and I dieted for about two years. Nice and steady, bringing it down, strict as anything. And I've never, people seem to think of me because I got so big and I've never been one for condition that I can't stick to a diet. I can stick to a diet. That ain't a fucking problem if I want to. The issue is having enough motivation to do it because the end goal is that important to me. And, and competing has never been a big factor since I lost the opportunity when I was younger. So anyway, I got down to... I think it was about 300, 306 pounds, somewhere around there. And I was sitting at 11% on calipers. So I was getting on step on stage, quite a monster. Didn't have the prettiest physiques because my chest was very weak, but I was still going to step on stage, quite a monster. Um, and I was sponsored by SSN. Everything was going well, but I was just fucking miserable. Right. Absolutely fucking miserable. And I just, and it wasn't the hardship of the diet. It was just, I, didn't want to stand in stage in my underpants covered in Marmite. Mm -hmm. I just, I just didn't want to do it. There was, there was, it was no appeal. It, it lost any glamour I felt it ever had because I knew I was stepping on stage, not being the best I could have been. Yeah. And that was sort of, to me, it was a bit, well, what's the fucking point? Now? If I can't be the best me, what's the point? I don't matter if I win a comp or don't win a comp. What matters is that I'm the best I could be. And I, in my head, I'd lost that when I told me pick off 15 yeah. years free. So um, at the time, Rich Piano was making big waves. He was still with, I can't remember who we were with at the time, but the company that originally sponsored him, uh, Mutant, was it? Mutant, something like that? Possibly, yeah, possibly. Uh, um, and he was being open to a degree about his drug use, which is the first time we'd seen anyone of such a high profile do it. Now, at that time, I'd already got involved with harm reduction. I was already working in harm reduction circles. I was constantly trying to increase my knowledge of the drugs and learn more and more about what, them, what they were and what they did. Um, both personal experience and research. 
And the guy that ran SSN UK said, would I be willing on my next book to do it all sort of live and do a basically a UK's version of Rich Piano? And I said, I would, but it would be the complete truth, unlike Rich's glamorized truth. And I wouldn't miss out the bad bits and I wouldn't miss out the addictive side of things. And, and it had to be warts and all. And it wouldn't be very Americanized and glam like his was. And they were fine with that. Well, he was. It went to head office and they said, no, ain't happening. But at that time, I was sold on it. I'd already thought, you know what, this, I want to do this. And I, wanted, I want to see how big I can get. Because I'd always wanted to see how big I could get. And I had this sort of feeling constantly when I was dieting that I was holding myself back from growing. That if I put food in, I was just going to explode. So... We had a chat. I resigned my sponsorship. Uh, I still got looked after exactly the same afterwards anyway. It didn't really make any difference. Uh, and we chose the project to be called Under Construction The Freak. Uh, wasn't a name I was particularly enamored with. I didn't like it. But the guy that run SSN UK was looking at bringing out his own supplement line called Freak Supplements. So it was going to tie in if it ever happened. And at the end of the day, you've got to be sensible and open into marketing positions in this industry because you don't make money out of it very easily uh, unless you're selling gear. So, <laughs> yeah, no. you're right. So, uh, that started the UC project. Um, and I went from just, just around £300 to £365 in seven months. And with what I feel was reasonable condition and good strength, I was repping seven plates in a squat. I was benching five plates for reps. I was shoulder pressing five plates for reps. Um, I was doing lateral raises with fucking 85, 90 pounders strict. Um, I was strong. And my arms at that point were about 25, 25 and a half. What uh, were you now, yes. say, again, say again. What were your calories then? 10,000. Wow. Clean as well. And this is the thing that people, when you, when you talk about calorie consumption with people, you've got to be very careful. Yeah. I can comfortably do 5,000 calories at McDonald's in one sitting without even fucking trying, and that's even now yeah. when I don't really eat much these days. Eat 10,000 calories of fucking boiled fish and boiled mm. chicken and rice. That's a different ball game. I mean, I was doing eight kilos of raw food a day. What were your ratios, Dave, like protein to carbs? Generally, I run carbs and proteins 50-50. Right. And then I just keep fats low. Okay. Um, so I don't count fats. Obviously, with that amount, of, I mean, I was doing three kilo of animal meat in one form or another a day. Yeah. So there's, there's a decent fat amount of fat in that. Yeah. But what I used to do was I used to slow cook it so all the fat came to the surface. Okay. So I reduced the fat as much as possible. And one of the things that came out of that, which we can get onto a bit later if you want, was that my LDL, considering how much animal protein I was consuming, actually was good. Right. Because everything was actually quite low fat. Meant it was incredibly bland tasting because it just tasted like, fuck, if you've ever had bold chicken, you know how fucking tasteless it is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, that's pretty much what every meal tastes like. So soya sauce was my friend. Yeah. <laughs> I used to go for a big bottle of soya sauce a fucking week. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what your actual amounts were, sort of protein, carbohydrates? Never counted them. Never no, no. I don't, I've never been a macros fan. Uh, yeah. And people look at you like you're fucking strange. Yeah. The danger with macros is that you start finding things that fit them. Yes. And if you look at the macro profile of a McDonald's, it actually doesn't look that fucking bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. So, you know... I'm a great believer in measuring your food and weighing your food, but I've never been one to actually count macros. Yeah. I know roughly where we are with, a, you know, how much protein is in 250 grams of chicken. I know roughly how many carbs are in 100 grams dry weight of rice. I've got a rough idea where it is, but I don't – it doesn't matter if I don't know the macros. As long as I'm consistent with my diet, I know what I'm intaking in volume, therefore I can adjust – up yes. if I'm not gaining at the rate I feel, or down if I feel I'm getting fat. Yes. So as long as you've got a decent idea, you know, you don't need to count your macros. And when I coach people, uh, when they start asking for macros straight away, I start getting suspicious. Yeah. And my first question is, why do you want to know? What difference does it make to you? Yeah. And usually when you get to the bottom, it's because they want to substitute. Yeah. And that isn't what the diet is. 
No. The biggest mistake people make when it comes to growing in the off season is that they eat shit. Yeah. Because it's the off season. Yeah. My off season diet is and was as clean, if not fucking cleaner, than most people's pre comp diets because I didn't have cheats. Yeah. Because when you're having 10,000 calories a day, you don't want to fucking eat. No, that's so true. The thought of a pizza is just like, fuck off. You know what I mean? I'd rather just miss a meal. That's a treat. Great. Thanks. I only had 8,000 today. That was fucking lovely. Were you um, drinking a tremendous amount of fluid at the same time? Dave? I was. And part of that was to physically get the food down because yeah. it would have been at least two meals of a day were force feeding. Yeah. Uh, and I would literally be opening my mouth, chewing water, swallow. Yeah. Because otherwise it wasn't going down. Simple as. Yeah. Uh, I've even had to get up in the middle of the night and finish meals because I know I haven't finished my food for the day. I was obsessive about eating. Um, yeah. Yeah. I got grumpy if I missed a meal by 10 or 15 minutes because I knew that meant that getting the next meal in was going to be even harder because I had less space between this meal and that meal to eat. So the only time I went any period of time without food was when I trained. So that was about a three-hour window. Right. Um, but, yeah, and... I got to that size. I was strong. I could still move about a relatively good condition considering the weight. And retrospectively from a, a sort of business and, and a sort of physique promotion point of view, I should have stayed there. Yeah. If I'd have tidied that up, I could have had a very, very marketable uh, physique. Something that I could have probably done a lot of promotion with. You, didn't didn't you say to me when we first met that you went to Body Power and the professionals wouldn't take photos with you because you were that big? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, no, I'd that. I'd met Branch Warren previously when I was judging at a Scottish show because I used to judge for the what is with the UK BFF. Yeah, uh, and he was a lovely guy, and we had a chat, and everything was great. When he saw me at Body Power in a T-shirt uh, at over. I think at that point I was about 380. Uh, he just turned around and walked away. Uh, and then I went round to CMP stand to see Alvin. Now, me and Alvin are friends. You know, yeah. Al Alvin, in a way, was responsible for this because he got the ball rolling again. Yeah. Uh, and he, he openly said to the photographer, the photographer wanted to take a photo, he said, and he says, there's no fucking way as a professional athlete I'm standing next to him. <laughs> he says... Put a couple of birds in between us, and I'm fine with that. But I said, I'm not fucking standing next to him. No way. No. Uh, and I was shocked at the levels of insecurity the pros had about their physical appearance. And to me, the pros still looked monstrously big, and I still felt they were a lot bigger than me. Yeah. It was only when I sort of saw photographs afterwards, it was like, fucking hell, actually, yeah, I did, did hold me on with him, didn't I? And uh, yeah, he did look quite small. I was I mean, amazed I on your, I think it was the first film under construction, when you're walking through, I think it's Meadow Hall. No, it's Trafford Centre, but is yeah. It? People are just standing still as you go past in shock. I, I was I was about three sixty five at that point. Yeah, uh, sixty three, sixty five when we filmed that. Although some people were actually making comments, which you just walked straight past and didn't say anything, which is as it should be. But I just couldn't believe they were actually doing that with the size of you. To be honest, I don't hear them. I don't mm. see people's reactions. My wife does, and she can get quite arsy about it. But I don't. I just I'm oblivious. I really am. Yeah. Um, where I started to get very apparent, as in people taking notice, was when I hit close to when I was about 390, 395. I was still, I was big, but I was still had some reasonable shape. Yeah. So I still looked like either a strong man or, or a, a very off season bodybuilder, but I had some reasonable shape. Yeah. And I remember people, we went to York, and the irony of this is quite weird. I remember people stopping me in the middle of York for photographs with the giant. Now, I'm only six foot. I'm not massively tall. Yeah. Six foot one, six foot and a half, somewhere around there. Uh, and Darren Sadler, who is a world's strongest man competitor and one of the world's strongest men, walked past us and nobody batted a fucking eyelid. And I'm, like, <laughs> I'm like, that's Darren Sadler for fuck's sake. You know what I mean? And it was really odd. Um, but that got a bit intrusive. Um, and I remember this was pri prior to actually starting the UC projects. I mean, you do get some. I, I was at the Cattlemen's Association in Harrogate when we had the British finals at Harrogate, and I was judging. And it was always the finals was always on my birthday. 
Um, and I went to the Canvas Association because they did a 72 ounce steak challenge or a 96 ounce steak challenge. I can't quite remember, but it's, it's, it's whoever eats it fastest get the record, uh, which I did at the time. Um, and um, there were people literally leaning over, filming it and sticking cameras in your face while I was eating it. And that was that's the only time I'd ever really noticed the intrusion. Right. I've had a couple of odd bits and bats. Uh, I remember a, a guy walking up to me in London. Standing next to me, pulling his phone out, taking a selfie, then fucking off. <laughs> I was still like, what the fuck? What's going on? And then I got off the train at King's Cross once in, in my, one of my let's, let's, let's be a poser today. I was going for some audition, actually, to play some part in an ad. Uh, so I had a real tight T-shirt on, big arms hanging out, everything like that. Jumps off the train in King's Cross. And this guy pushing a trolley was too busy looking at me. He pushed trolley off track and ended up in fucking bottom leg <laughs> tracks. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, that, so that should have been a stop point, but but I was um, determined to move on. Yeah. So I was just about to start what became UC two, um, and my back went into spasm. One one well, basically about three o'clock in the morning when I was having a shit. Um, that left me in a. I was hospitalised because the pain was that bad. Uh, and they just ran out of painkillers. They just turned around and said, there's nothing else we can fucking give you. You're just going to have to deal with it. Um, anyway, that started to improve. I went back to the gym too early. And I've always, for a very long time, due to an injury, a, a, an accident years ago, I've had very poor glute activation and very poor lower ab wall activation. Now, that never really bothered me. It didn't affect my training, so I didn't give a fuck. But with my lower back getting out of action as well, the load of moving me around, bearing in mind I'm fucking 26, 27 stone at this point, uh, was taken over by my psoas, and it just went under spasm, and it clamped around my femoral nerve. So the beginning of UC2, I'm effectively wheelchair-bound, and I'm, I'm crawling up the four flights of steps to the gym on my hands and knees. I'm crawling in between machines on my hands and knees. I can't do anything three-way unless I'm braced. Climbing up into the machine, doing the set, crying to myself a little bit because of the pain and then crawling off to the next one because we'd started the project um and unfortunately i was up on cycle down on cycle our injury will go in a few weeks then it it felt a little bit better so i brought the drugs back up and then it flared up again so i brought the drugs back down and what was supposed to be your standard sort of 14 16 week cycle ended up being well over a year wow. uh, and you you it's probably hard sometimes to business, but you know how things are when a week soon turns into a month and a month soon turns into three months, you know, like, uh, yeah, I'm going to get back in shape in a couple of weeks time. And then you look back and think, fuck me, I said that in February, it's now August. Yeah. It was that sort of scenario. Um, I got bigger, I eventually got back to full training and full mobility. I got bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, but I got to the point where I was very much looking at what more drugs can I take? Right. Um, what more can I do? Um, rather than how harder can I train? Yeah. How can I get more food in? You know? Yeah. And I saw the weight coming on. I was using insulin and growth as well at this point. So there was a lot of war retention. There was a lot of glycogen retention, which I was mistaking for muscle growth. And then I just remember sitting on a toilet at three o'clock in the morning doing another GH jab because I had to get up in the night to do my GH jabs because I was on so much of this stuff. And I just remember sitting there thinking, I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. This is enough. Yeah. Um, and the strange thing was the next morning or the day after, might even be the day after, because we already had this rule that if the wife says it stopped, it stopped. And she just turned around and said, I don't want you to do this anymore. And I said, I've already made that decision, love. And then within a week of that, I was hospitalized with kidney failure. Right. Um, when I went in, my GFR was 20, um, and I weighed 415 pounds. When I came out, this is the funny thing. Now, as I'd been going on at this point, I'd been getting more and more paranoid about how much body fat I appeared to be gaining, and I couldn't understand why I was. So I'd been starting to restrict my calories a bit to try and get my condition back under control. Uh, I came out of hospital at 3.55 with visible, with the outline of abs showing. So I had the side walls and just the basics of the, the abs set starting to show. Wow. At 355 fucking pounds. That wasn't fat, that was water. Water. 
So effectively, I'd been dieting all this time and not realizing I was getting leaner because I was carrying so much water because my kidneys were fucked. You can't actually believe how much water then your body can hold, can you? Uh, when you go for a piss and you find out that your dick is now about two and a half inch across because it's that swollen with water retention, you know you've got a problem. Yeah. <laughs> and I'd been down once to A&E and this bitch of a fucking nurse had sent me home and said, no, there's nothing wrong with you. So I rang up the next day to, to spoke to the manager because they all have ward managers now and, and department managers. And I kicked off fucking royally. Uh, and she said, right, come back in today and we'll get you seen again. So I went back in and I was in a, like a side ward where they sort of sit you until they decided they're going to take you in or they're going to send you home. Uh, and she said, yeah, your kidney function's really bad. But we don't need to worry unless we get to the point where your genitals start swelling up. And I waddled off for a piss. And then I came back and went, you know what you said about your willy swelling up? <laughs> well, actually, <laughs> I've, I've got bollocks aside of footballs. <laughs> I was like, oh, shit. Oh. Hour later, I was on my way to Leeds to the renal department. Wow. Um, I mean, my kidney function now is uh, GFR 36. So it has improved. It's been a lot of work to get it. Yeah, can you, you, if I can get it into the 40s, then they should last me the rest of my life. But if if I stay where I am, there's, there is always going to be a risk that they're going to decline to yeah. the point of dialysis. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, the second project was really, I found the limit. And I'd already said I'd rather find limits than, than, than set them. Yeah. Um, it was a bit of a catchphrase that came out of the films, actually, but I definitely found my limit, uh, and I have no regrets. No. And in a strange way, in fact, I was talking about this on my live Q&A last night. I do a live Q&A on Instagram on a Thursday night. I just started it. Eight o'clock, plug, plug, plug. Um, well, get it in there. Links at the bottom. But, <laughs> but um, I, um, I was saying this last night. I think, really, retrospectively looking at it, if my kidneys hadn't have failed, I would now be dead. Yeah. Because I would have continued yeah. at £365. I would have marketed that, which would have made me quite popular and quite successful. Uh, and as a result of that, I wouldn't be able to back out of it. Yeah. yeah. That would have probably ended up leading to me being on the drugs for too long and them actually causing me to die. Where because I had kidney failure, I stopped everything. Right. You had like a bit of a warning shot then, your body. Yeah, and I just stopped you everything. warning shot and said, yeah. So if I hadn't pushed it to the limits, I, I do think I actually would have probably died. Would you say, Dave, that the food was a contributing factor as well as the drugs? Or would you more just well, say probably the drugs or the combination? Strangely, when I went to the renal consultant in Leeds, and I was under the, the, the head honcho there, um, mainly because they hadn't dealt with anybody of my size. So they dragged him in because it's like, look, we don't really know what to do with this guy because we don't know what his benchmarks are going to be because his numbers are going to be so different to everybody else's. Yes. He said, in his opinion, that it was my sheer size that had got to the point where my internal organs could no longer support the structure yeah. I had built. Yeah. But... I believe it was a combination of everything. Yeah. And the drugs played the role, and it was lifestyle rather than any specific thing. But without doubt, at the end of the day, without the drugs, I wouldn't have got that size. Yeah, yeah. So ultimately, it's the drugs that are behind the problems. I mean, it's not the drug's fault. It's my fault. Yeah, yeah. There are no bad drugs. They're yeah. just people that take drugs. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. So... Um, what was your training plan at that time then, Dave? Because, I mean, I could be wrong here, but when we spoke when you came here and then watching under construction, you seemed to be a very high-intensity style guy rather than maybe a massive volume. Approach. Yeah, volume bores, bores the living shit out of me. Yeah. I get bored. Once we start getting into 10 reps, I'm starting to fucking look around and I just yeah. get bored. Yeah. I can't deal with it. Um, it all looked very strict as well. It looked like you really tried to move the weight correctly, even though you were doing a lot of weight. I am a bit of a foot. Well, I am a bit of a form Nazi, but not in the traditional way. I, right. I'm very much about muscular engagement and making yeah. sure that what you're doing is going where you want it to go. Yes. 
Yeah, sometimes just moving big weights for the hell of it is good for the ego and it's good for the soul. There's no denying that. And I had my times of ego lifting without doubt. Yeah. I mean, it was never necessary for me to do a 260 kilo bent of a row, but I still did one. Yeah. yeah. And, and when you look back at that, you think, Jesus Christ, you might as well just cut both your biceps off because you were really pushing your luck there. You know what I mean? But you do these stupid things. But yeah. I've always been, I was brought up on pain when it came to training. Yeah. So if I have a workout and I trained a body part and it wasn't screaming in agony by the end of it, then I would be disappointed. disappointed. But I also had a rule that I had X amount of sets to do it in. And if I didn't do it in those sets, I had to walk away and deal with the fact that I was a lazy cunt. Yeah. Because that meant I came back the next time determined not to make that happen again. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've always favored a three on one off every body part twice a week. Okay. Not particularly high volume, so you'd be looking at anywhere around 10 sets for a small body part, like biceps, sometimes even eight. Yeah. Uh, 10 to 12 for triceps. Shoulders would be a little bit more just because you've got three heads to deal with. So shoulders would be 15, maybe 16. And obviously, as you get into the bigger weights, you need more warm-ups. Yes. So I was behind an air pressing five plates. Yes, it was on a Smith's machine before anyone starts bitching. Uh, but you're not getting into five plates in two sets. You know, it's it's yeah, the bar, it's one, it's two, it's three, it's four, then it's five. Yeah. And so volume increased a little bit because of that. Yeah. Um, but then quads, 12, 14 sets, because at that point I usually couldn't even support my own body weight. Yeah. Uh, hamstrings would be eight to 10, calves would be, they varied a lot. I used to just generally annihilate them rather than actually. It's such a stubborn muscle group, you can really give it some shit. Yeah. Uh, uh, chest was 12 to 14, back was 14 to 16. But again, because back's such a big muscle group, if you're doing it right, by 12 sets, you should be getting to the point where you're starting to really feel fucked. Yeah. Um, and again, volume went up a little bit when I was handling bigger weights because it was taking me longer to get up there. I mean, at my strongest, I was the low row at Maloney's. What was that now? I think that was a 400. No, the 400 or 500 pound stack. Right. It's huge. It's monstrous. His, leg, his calf raise is 1,050 pound. What would you... I used to stack that bastard. <laughs> What's your take, Dave? Because the drug situation on training in the sense of how much... Because I had a conversation, it's a long, a lot of years ago, short conversation with Ollie and Yates about this. And he believed that the drugs made all the difference to him when he went on them, when it came to the recovery side. Because a lot of people now are saying that natural athletes can do the same volume, the same frequency as people that take drugs, whereas I... Yeah, you know, yeah but what, what people are missing is they don't do the same intensity. Yes, Yes. So, as a natural athlete, I can bench, for argument's sake, this is just an example, I'm not saying this is what I can do, but say as a natural athlete, I can bench 140 kilo, and I can do that for eight reps. Yes. And I fail on the ninth. Mm -hmm. As an assisted athlete, I would get the eighth, I would get the ninth, and I'd fail on the tenth. Yes. So, the drugs have allowed me to push my body beyond its capability. Yes. As a result, the damage that's then created is beyond my natural recovery. Yes. So it's that intensity end that changes. Mm -hmm. I don't change my training style whether I'm on cycle or off cycle. Well, I never used to if I was on or off cycle. Yeah. Because uh, all that happened was there was a slight reduction in the top end of weight and there was a slight reduction in intensity because my natural recovery yes. managed that. Okay. It's that workout that built it, so it's that workout that's mm -hmm. going to fucking keep it. Yeah, absolutely. The only time I changed my training if I was dieting hard because – it would blow my head when I started to lose strength. So I would change to more voluminous training so it disguised the fact that I wasn't as strong as I was when I was full off-season, full of gear yeah. and mountainous of food. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I would change the training style and probably do one exercise that was heavy load and then everything else would be more volume-based, more rep-based, and putting supersets, drop sets, stuff like what that. What about the um, the frequency with the drugs? Did you feel like you could train a little bit more frequently rather than... Well, no, because I say I had the same frequency all the time. Yeah. All, that, all that changed between being on cycle and off cycle was that 
that final end. set, that end, yeah. where on drugs I'd get an extra rep or even an extra two reps, yeah. which the week after would mean I'd be moving more weight. Yes. Whereas off cycle, I'm struggling to get that half rep that I keep failing on every week. So I keep failing at nine and a half reps on my bench. Yeah. And that's going to stay the same for several, several weeks before it hits 10. Yeah. And then I'm going up maybe two and a half kilo. Yeah. Where as on cycle, I'd struggle to just put a 10 kilo aside on as a jump because I thought it was too little. Right. Fives and two and a half didn't exist when I were on cycle. It was half plates or full plates and that was it. There was nothing else. Right. Okay. <laughs> so if you got if you got your six to eight reps with five plates squatting, then your next set was either five and a half or six plates. It was as simple as that. Yeah. Yeah. And you just you just did it. Yeah. And I think I was chatting to Andy Bolton about this um, a couple of months ago. Andy comes over quite a lot, actually. <clears throat> and we were we were um, we were talking about we did it because we didn't know any different. Mm-hmm. So he he was pulling way over three hundred kilo, and I had no idea that that at the time was incredibly strong. It's not so much. I mean, it's still a decent deadlift, but these days strength has progressed so much of recent years that. Yeah. You know, we've gone from 11 people being able to deadlift 400 to probably 100 people being able to deadlift 400. Yeah. So, um, but at the time, he said they had no conception that they were training at the level they were or that they were at the strength they were because they, there was no internet. Yeah. yeah. There was no Instagram. There was no sharing posts. So you had no one to compare with. Yeah. And lucky or unlucky, depending on how you want to look at it, I spent most of my training career in a gym that had pro athletes, that had world champions, that had world champion powerlifters training there. So when it came to squatting, I'd try and aim so I squatted on the day that the powerlifters did, and I'd jump in with them. Yeah. They were only doing singles and doubles and triples where I was doing sets. Yeah. But I still tried to match them for weight. Yeah. And I'd convince myself that it didn't matter that they only did two reps with it. If I didn't match that weight, they were beating me. So that was my challenge. That was what I was chasing. I was chasing their asses all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I wasn't a good bencher, I'd I'd make sure I trained with someone who could bench five plates or more. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That way, it brought mine up. Yeah. You know. Uh, so I used to always chase, uh, but at the same time, I've always had this fight with myself in the gym. So what's your take on the progressive overload then, Dave? I know that'll be of importance, but... Was well, it, it, it is just simply that. It's progressive. Yeah. You know, would, that the problem... be, would that be your be-all and end-all, though? Or would it be have, the, have to have the form no matter what? And then that... I would oh. tend to be a little bit instinctive. So what would generally happen is form would be really tight. I'd probably incorporate a lot of TUT work for a while. And then I start when I felt like I was in position to do so. I would start pushing more weight. Yeah. And the weights would get heavier and heavier and heavier. And then I, I just know that things are starting to get a bit sloppy. Yeah. So I wouldn't push any heavier, but I tidy everything up. Right. Then yeah. I might, might go back into a little bit of bit of TUT for a week or two, and then I push again. Okay. Um, but the thing is that I find what a lot of people do, which I've never really done is they'll do, and we'll use bench press again, just because it's one of the most popular exercises, but they do six, seven, eight, rack. What I'd do, six, seven, eight, and go for nine. Yeah. And that's the edge of progression. Yeah. That's the bit that makes you grow. Yeah. Because you're going to the limit of what you can do. Yeah. I wasn't a big one for force reps. I didn't like a lot of force reps because most no. people couldn't spot for shit. Yeah. Uh, and it took too much. I, I've actually been known when shoulder pressing to try and fucking back headbutt the cunt behind me that was spotting me because he was taking too much load off me. Yeah. I used to shout and scream at people because they took too much weight off the bar. I think I'm supposed to struggle with it. You know what I mean? That's the idea. As long as I'm holding form, yeah. don't touch the bastard thing. I think sometimes, like you said, though, when you're pushing yourself to that extreme, Sometimes a force rep's almost impossible, isn't it? When somebody tries to help you, there's just nothing there sometimes. A lot yeah, of but you've, just, you, you've got to discipline yourself to hold form yeah. under extreme load. Yeah. And that's where a lot of people can't. Yeah. You know, they get to that rep, which is everything they've got, and they're doing fucking river dance. Yeah. 
Uh, and you've just got to learn, plant the feet, plant the hips, lock back, head into the bench, and drive. Yeah. And if it doesn't move, it doesn't fucking matter. Yeah. And people are so obsessed with, I hate logbooks, absolutely love logbooks, because right. people are so obsessed with achieving a number. Yes. That isn't what training's about. Training's about damaging the muscle yeah. so that it responds by overcompensating and growing. Mm-hmm. You don't do that because you've done six, seven, or eight reps. You do that because you've been intense and you've dis- you've trained the muscle to the point where it's done. Yeah, yeah. If you're aiming for eight reps, you get to the point where your last rep or your last two reps aren't even hitting the muscle you're trying to train because you're using everything else to move the weight. Well, this, this is the point I keep trying to make with people because the problem with the sole focus of progressive overload is – the, the, the running around gym like it's best thing in the world when they've got an extra rep, but they could, they could have probably got that extra rep the week before if the form had gone to shit to get it, like they've just done to get that one. You know, so they're not keeping that form. So you're not stronger really because you didn't do it like that the week before. And that's the problem. It starts to create bad habits and you've yeah. got to be very self-conscious of this. You've yeah. got to really watch. I say I was lucky. I was in a gym with a lot of good heads. So you soon got pulled if things got flaky. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but over time, you learn that self-discipline yourself. Yeah. And it's something that never leaves. I mean, I, I don't think I've trained in any intensity in a gym for over two and a half years. Right. Uh, but I can still get under a bench and go to max failure, though it might be a very lightweight comparatively, without breaking form, because it's so programmed into me right. now that that's how you do it. I can't do it any other way. Yeah. So I considered going for um, comp benching because I've got a pretty decent – well, I had a pretty decent raw bench, even though my chest was a very weak body part. My shoulders were immensely strong. Right. Um, and uh, I was doing 220 raw for five reps. Right. But uh, when I looked at it, it was like, well, you need to develop explosive power. You need to dr- – and I couldn't do that. No. I was <laughs> – and that's how I trained. I couldn't do it any other way. Yeah, I, I spent so long training myself, control down, control up, control down, control up, make sure the muscle's doing the work. I remember was, watching, um, you probably saw it, I remember watching Eddie Elwood when he went to the strongman and when he was shoulder pressing, he was still controlling the negative and then driving it up where, you know, with the muscles, whereas everybody else was just bashing it up and down. And like you say, that's just because to get out of that would be very difficult after all them years of doing that. And, and, and there's, there's, there's positive and negatives to that. So I have very few joint issues. My knees, my elbow. I've got arthritis in my feet, but that's a family trait. As it turns out, my mum had it and my granddad had it and God knows who else. Um, but like my knees are good, my hips are good, my elbows are good, my shoulders are good. Right. What I have got is a lot of muscular tears. Yeah. Because I've pushed them to the point where they've broken. Yeah, yeah. But I haven't got joint issues because I've never trained in that explosive sloppy form. So my joints have never been hammered. It's always my muscles that have been hammered. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my, my injury list for tears is fucking scripture-like. But <laughs> yeah, It is, though, Dave, because people always say to me, because, you know, I, I get injuries and I train as strict as I can and things, but if you're pushing yourself as much as possible, it's probably inevitable at some time or another, isn't it, that something's going to possibly tear yeah. Well, well so I mean, it's in your limits, then you know. I mean, I haven't used a belt in the gym in the last 10 years, right? So, the heavy benching, the seven plate squats for reps, the eight plate squats, the 260 bent of a row were all done with no belt, right? Because if you train properly, you don't need one, yeah, 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 because you, build, you build stability everywhere. Mm-hmm. Is that why you've had probably some ages then? Because you've probably trained to that uh, last rep, yeah. and then you've got. Yeah, I've, I've trained to the point where in your uh, head, there is just absolutely nothing left. Yeah. Um, the muscles coming off the bone, virtually. <laughs> I, I've, I've never had a tear on the first or second rep. They've always been seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth yeah. reps when I'm well into the set, yeah. and they are torn because of failure. Yeah. Um, one physio did suspect that because my kidneys had actually been compromised for quite some time and it had never been picked up 
that I may have had problems with hydration within the muscle, which may have had to subsidiarity of tears. But my, my left pec detachment was my first tear. I've torn this pec three times. I've torn this bicep and that bicep, both leg pressing, which sounds really weird. But you grip the bars and then you're pressing. And I slipped in the seat. So the whole fucking several hundred kilo that was on the load was then on my arm. <laughs> so that's how I told the bicep. <laughs> Right. So this one's split right down the middle, and this one's got a, a gouge out here. Tore my left tricep, my left lat, tore my forearms quite a few times, right quad three times, left quad twice, both hamstrings, left calf. <laughs> which, which was most painful? <laughs> the most pain I've ever experienced was the entrapment of my femoral nerve. I've never felt pain like that. I literally was crying with pain. And if someone had said to me, I'll put a bullet for your head, I'd have gone, yeah, put me out in misery. It was immense. I was drinking morphine like there was no tomorrow and it wasn't touching it. Right. And the thing is, like, I'm, I'm on pre-gabbling now because I still have some nervous twinges. Right. I can only take 50 milligrams. If I take any more, I go bonkers. <laughs> so I can't, I can't even take high-dose pain, you know, nervous blockers because they send me absolutely fucking do lally. <laughs> I'm in another universe if I go up to 75. Honestly, I think I'm on another planet. It's really odd. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I've had injuries because my primary drive was to challenge me in the gym. Everything else has really been secondary to that. Yeah. So competing, getting big, they were more byproducts of that constant drive to challenge in the dream. Yeah, I've abused drugs, but I abused drugs in a conscious decision. I deliberately set out to abuse drugs. Mm -hmm. I wasn't sitting there going, oh, well, my drug use is okay because of X, Y, Z. I was sat there going, oh, my drug use is fucking horrendous. Mm -hmm. But how am I going to learn and how are we going to learn about high-dose drug use if someone doesn't fucking do it and say something about it? Yeah. So... You know, you speak to a lot of guys and uh, what they call uh, cognitive uh, dissidents, where they, they will start to justify their use because, well, I'm fit and healthy and I train not like these fat fucks that eat McDonald's and smoke. Well, what's that? What have they got to do with your health? They've got absolutely nothing to do with your health. You're just trying to, you know, throw it somewhere else so you don't have to look at the fact that you abuse drugs. Um, I, I may, But then again, I mean, my highest dose was four and a half touch five gram but mainly four and a half i only touch five gram for a few weeks uh i know several people that run those levels and more on a regular basis um i'm not going to name names because i've always said from the day i started doing shit like this and talking to people i would never be one that named names yeah uh it's just not my style i know a lot of people have got very popular over throwing dirt but it's not my style because it's their private lives that you're dealing with I know pros that take 500 mig a week, quite genuinely. I know pros that have never gone over a gram, a gram and a half and stood on the Olympia stage. And I know pros that are hammering five, six, seven G. Right. You know, there's such a wide spectrum. Yeah. The, the problem that you see a lot now is, and this is going to sound a bit awful, but people just don't know how to fucking train. Right. If, you, if you remove drugs, so if I pressed a button on my desk now and there was no steroids available anywhere in the world, 60, probably 70% of the people that currently go to the gym and use drugs would probably stop going within six months. Yeah. Because they can't progress. They can't progress because the training shit, because they, they don't really have the aptitude for this at that level. Mm -hmm. they, they could happily go down to the gym for a few weeks around, send a few messages to the mates, have a chat with a lad they haven't seen for a couple of weeks, and, and come away from that feeling fine. Yeah. But never going to progress because they just don't have the aptitude or the stomach for the intensity it requires. Yeah. Unless you add drugs. Mm. And that's why we see in a growth, well, not the only reason, there's all sorts of factors that go into it, but one of the reasons we've seen this massive growth in drug use and mm. this massive growth in the doses that people use is because people can't grow without it because they don't know how to train. Yeah. Training is a craft that takes years to learn properly. If you're starting out, train with the more enhanced, more advanced trainers as often as you can. Like I said, I was lucky. At a very early age, I was training with some very high-quality bodybuilders. 
Um, I even trained with a guy called Stuart. I can't remember Stuart's last name now. He was about 19 stone, heavyweight kickboxer, lean. But everything he did was TU2. Right. So when you train with him, you had no choice but to be pitch perfect because you were taking six, seven, eight, nine, even 10 seconds to do one rep. Yeah. Everything was slow. Everything was controlled. Everything was full range. But they're the people you want to train with. Yeah. You know, because you learn discipline and then you learn structure and then you can push hard relatively safely. Yeah. And and people are just scared of hard workouts. I agree. I 100% agree. I mean, I can remember when I first started, training was everything. Yeah. Then, well, we had to say, yeah, you know, then you had to eat well, get the nutrition as good as you could. And then if you were going to go down the drug route, that was the next step. Whereas most people you talk to now, the drugs are the first thing. Then it's how much food can I eat? And the training is the little bit that they just do on the end. You know, that's, that's how it seems. I, I mean, I grew up in an era where you trained hard, you ate a lot of protein, and then you just ate whatever you fuck you wanted. Yeah. I think you still stayed in reasonable conditions. So how did you stay in reasonable condition if you were eating shit? Well, you stayed in reasonable condition because you were training so fucking intensely. It didn't really matter. Yeah, yeah. But I said those days are well gone. Uh, people get so wrapped up in science and, and AMRAP sets and, and macros and neat values and this and that. The amount of times people come to me and say, right, I'm, you know, you're talking about dieting and well, this is my neat value and this is how many steps I do there. Look, just eat less and move fucking more. Yeah. Because for 90% of people, the condition they want to achieve, that's it. That's done. Comp condition, that's a slightly different story. Yeah. But to get lean, so you've got a few abs showing for summer, that doesn't take science. It just takes effort. Yeah. And nobody wants effort. They want a magic pill. They want something to do it for them. I'm yeah. guilty of that to a degree. Yeah. You know, uh, I think we all are to a point. You know, I, I, yeah, I all right, not with arthritis in my feet the way it is, but the shop's walkable. I could walk there. Uh, but no, I'll drive in a car. Yeah. I know you exactly. know, we're all guilty of taking shortcuts, but. Uh, yeah. Some, some of the most, like on social media, I know now, because that's my area, but some of the most watched stuff is, you know, do four sets of 10, three month transformations, you know, things like that. All these marketing gimmicks where you're seeing these programs. I've been training with Craig and doing the hit and I've, I've never felt better and I walk out of there thinking yeah I've done it and I literally do three movements each, each I, yeah, I do about three exercises of the body part I don't think there's many people on this planet can actually do true hit and, and actually to a degree and I don't mean this in a nasty sense but I blame Dorian for some of the shit training we get now you see when Dorian hit the scene he presented a physique we'd never ever seen before it was incredible Everybody wanted to know what he did, and it came out, it was Mike Menza hit, yeah. right? Now, Dorian threw in a few more sets for the same reason I did, because he needed to warm up to get up to those heavyweights he was yeah. using. Yeah. But people didn't grasp the intensity that Dorian created. Yeah. Now, I've never had the honor of training with Dorian at his peak, but I've trained with his training partners. Mm -hmm. So I've had a taste of what level of intensity he was generating in the gym. And I've probably met five people in my whole life that could match that um and this is one of the big problems everybody went on to hip one body part a week hit training but didn't get anywhere because they couldn't generate the intensity yeah and it's in unless you've experienced it unless you've been in a gym and trained with someone who trains at that level of intensity it's very difficult to grasp the concept of what that is yeah um, yeah, and as a result people fall short don't progress well it can't be me training because I'm training in the same style Dorian does so it must be the drugs that are shit so I'll just take more yeah and that's quite literally how people look at it yeah I mean yeah. we we did some I remember doing a leg press session started at 800 kilo ended at 150 which I failed on that's how it was drop sets continuously. I, I've lost count at about 75 reps. I fuck knows how many I did. I puked on myself halfway through it. I'd half pissed myself. And when they finished, I couldn't get up. I had to be dragged out and just dumped at the side of the leg press where the next guy got in because I couldn't fucking move. Yeah. And, and that's intense. It may not be sensible. 
and it may not be repeatable every week, but that's intensive. Yeah. Did I've you, seen. Did I you remember uh, did you blowing out his eardrums, squatting, and he carried on going? <laughs> did you do cycles, Dave? In the sense of, did you do so many weeks as hard as you could, and then the I, famous I was, keyboard I, words that everybody uses now, or how did you do it? No, I was instinctive. Right. So I didn't structure things. I just knew, you know, or yeah. a bit niggly, or fucking hell, yeah. I just knew. Yeah. Um, the, the, I had a very simple sort of guideline. One shit workout, give yourself a talking to. Yeah. Two shit workouts, bollock yourself. Three shit workouts, something's wrong. Yeah. You might be ill. You might need a couple of days off. Yeah. But something's wrong. If I got three crappy workouts in a row, then something was wrong. Yeah. Yeah, I get that. I get that. And that was pretty much my rule of thumb. Did you, when you, if you had those, if you ever took any time off, Dave, did you keep the nutrition and everything on point all the time or did you take breaks yeah. from it? No, why, why would you change that? At the end of the day, that's what you need to sustain. If you're only taking, if you're taking two weeks off, then obviously you need to consider reducing your calories a little bit. Yeah, yeah. But if you're only taking a couple of days off, what yeah. the fuck? You're yeah. trying to recover. You're taking days off because you haven't recovered. Yeah, yeah. So rather, why would you reduce your intake when you need that intake to help you recover? True. Yeah, absolutely. do not make any sense to me. <laughs> right. yeah, exactly, yeah. <clears throat> what's What's... I know this is really difficult, Dave, because it's the, the questions can be really difficult now in the sense of just... If I know you can't give out what someone um, could potentially use, or because everybody's you know that bit different, and but do you, what what is your take on what some of the pro bodybuilders say now, or, or the ex pro bodybuilders? And again, we won't name names, but they give a milligramage dosage per week that if a guy's not getting close to maybe turning professional at that point, then he probably doesn't have the genetic ability and everything else to be able to do so. Do you have a benchmark on that at all or any particular drugs or, or anything for that style of thing? Or do you think yeah. that's nonsense? I mean, I don't think you can beat Test and Decker for off-season growth. I just I don't think I, there's anything on this planet that beats that. Okay. Um, it's old school, it's boring, it's not fancy, it's not complicated, it's not trendy, yeah. but it fucking works. Yeah, yeah. Um, regards dosages to achieve certain levels. No, because people are very different. Yes. So, you know, you can have genetics to build muscle. You can have genetics to stay lean. Yeah. You can have genetics that you diet well or, or whatever it may be, or that you've strong. Yes. But you can also have genetics over drug tolerances. Yeah. Yeah. You so can now, be genetically gifted in the sense that you can take a lot of fucking gear. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember there were two guys trained in the gym. I won't mention the names, though. I think one of them might even be dead now anyway. And they trained together, and they took the same cycles. One grew like they trained the same intensity. They did train very similar. One grew, one didn't. Right. And everything else was on point. Yeah. He just didn't grow. Right. And he ended up taking one and a half times what his mate did to yeah. come anywhere near to matching him with progress. Right. And then, I, I, you know, I know a, a certain pro, fuck me, the cunt would grow muscle if he was sucking on cabbage leaves. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, okay. It's just so genetically gifted. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's not to take anything away from the hard work that he did. No. But at the end of the day, he genetically predispositioned to grow muscle. Yeah. yeah. I'm genetically predispositioned to get big. Yeah. I can grow muscle, but I grow fat with it. Yeah. Only yeah. condition is hard work for me. Um, and I've got a, a generally a very good tolerance to drugs. I don't suffer with sides much. Yeah. So I can handle the cycles. I can grow well. I've just got to be super tight on diet. Otherwise, I just end up like a fucking, well, a, a fat fuck than I am. Is the period of a cycle, Dave, that you think is maybe too short or too long or, or those types of things? Yeah, I would have said, you know, if you're doing injectables and you're sort of looking at four to six week cycles, I don't see which point in that. Okay. Uh, fast axis, maybe. But, uh, you know, a, a traditional cycle length of anywhere between 10 and 16 weeks, most people average around 12. Yeah. Um, 
I, I, it's, it's perfectly fine. Yeah. You could run a bit over, but I would recommend you get your bloods done and just see where your markers are before you make that decision. It gets difficult when you're doing off season. I mean, I was chatting to a pro, was it this week or last or this week? And he was saying he's due to start his off season, but his next competition is supposed to be X. And really, if he does, he's not going to have time for an off season cycle, a break, and a pre comp. He's going to have to merge it straight through, which yeah. means he's then staying on for extended periods of time, which he doesn't want to do. Yeah. But it's, it's his business, it's his livelihood. And this is where things start to change. These guys are getting paid for this shit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know? So you there's, are, there's you another, another dimension it. to it then. You are a big believer, though, in people coming off, aren't you? Because of the, there's all this blasting and cruising that people recommend now. If you're going to cruise, you cruise on levels that replicate natural hormone. You do not cruise on 250 meg, 300 meg a week. That is not cruising. No, yeah. And, and the only way you know if you're cruising in the correct dose is because you've got bloods that show you're cruising in the correct dose. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, sorry, I was going to say, how close do you think SAMs are to the, the drugs? Are they sort of how Well, SAMs are research chemicals. The, the brief that was given was we want a drug that's anabolic, selective, and non suppressive. So it has to attach to muscle tissue, it shouldn't suppress the natural endocrine system, and it needs to attach to the DAR. They've never made a drug that does that. No. They're either non-selective or they're non-suppressive. Well, they're suppressive, should I say. So, SAMs are, they're not as potent as steroids. Uh, and one of the big advantages with SAMs is the vast majority are tissue selective. So, you don't get issues with prostate enlargement. You don't get issues with acne through sebaceous gland or DHT in the scalp and stuff like that. But they are still in a, a in a quite a few cases, especially stuff like YK11 and Rad140. They are suppressive. Yeah. Uh, Anderine, sorry, uh, no, Osterine, sorry, um, which was one of the first ones to done, is probably one of the ones that's closest to the original berries. Right. Um, but it's not as powerful, so therefore it's not as popular. Yeah. Um, I've seen some pretty impressive results off sound only cycles. Right. But some, some psalms will require some form of PCT or downtime. Yeah, yeah. And, and well, I have seen people become so TRT dependent because of psalm use. Oh, really? Right, okay. It's not common, but I have seen people do yeah, it. Yeah, What do you, what, when we spoke, Dave, I think you said that you quite liked the MK677, didn't you? Which I know is not a psalm, but um, do you no, still... It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a non-peptitic growth hormone release thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I found it useful for appetite if people yeah. can't eat. Yeah. You've got to watch your blood glucose with it. It can suppress your blood glucose. It can cause problems with BG. Yeah. But I found if you run something like berberine as a GDA, then you, that will offset that and there's no real major issues with it. I mean, growth hormone itself will suppress your insulin sensitivity over time if you run it too consistently for too long. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I mean, sounds have their place. Uh, pro hormones are just steroids anyway. If you're going to take a pro hormone, you might as well take an oral steroid. It's exactly the same fucking thing. Yeah, yeah. And the only the only good thing about pro hormones was because they were generally regulated. Uh, you you were usually getting what you were paying for. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Where with orals, it was always well. Is it really Anavar or is it just Ebon? What do you think of <laughs> the, um, the GH and the insulin, Dave? In the sense of that, a lot of people feel that that's what's not ruined physiques necessarily, but change the, you know, where you've got the belly situation and things. Oh, that's a load of bollocks. If that was the case, every fucking dwarf would be walking around with a huge yeah. fucking gut. Yeah. And punts hammer growth hormone like it's going out of fashion. Yeah, yeah. Absolute bollocks. The insulin as uh, well. You think that yeah, well? no, right. Growth and insulin together will drive glycogen and muscle water into the muscle. If you're a 220, 240 pound bodybuilder or a 100 kilo bodybuilder, you can be looking at putting 20 pound on and okay. not look any fatter. Okay. Stop the drugs and you'll just piss it all away. Right. Okay. Uh, Rich Piano used to use it a lot pre expo because he could come into an expo looking 20, 25 pound bigger than he really was. Right. He used it generally for that reason. Pros use it off season quite a bit sometimes because they need to look big for a, an event. Right. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me. I've never, I've never heard of it or done it or know of it. But it wouldn't surprise me if it's usable into a show, so you're coming fuller and bigger. Yeah. But it doesn't cause muscle growth. Absolute bollocks. 
Right, okay. What uh, would you what would you think would mistake you... that swelling in yeah. the muscle for growth? Right. If that was the case, all these daft pillocks that are fucking running it would all be stepping on Olympia next year, wouldn't they? True, that's it, that is true, yeah. Because they're all playing thirty pounds at time. Situation then, Dave. Uh <sighs> I know it's difficult to say, but oh, I mean, no, it's not. I've got an answer. I'm just trying yeah. to think of what the name is. Uh, who was it that first brought the plate loading machines in? Um, was it Hammer Strength? Yeah, there you go. That's why people have got GH Pillar. What's known as GH Pillar. Right. And you're going to sit there and go, what the fuck? Machine training. Right. No core control. No core strength. No core control. Why would you need core control? Because the machine's doing it. Is that what you think it is, genuinely? Yes, genuinely. Yeah. Because otherwise, are you telling me then that one year this bodybuilder comes on with uncontrollable belly, pronounced like fuck, and we have seen it, and then the next year it's under control? But yeah. he's still the same size or he's bigger. So has he suddenly stopped yeah. all these protocols? No, yeah. he's learned to control his core. Yeah. Johnny Jackson, does he use less drugs than anyone else? No. So yeah. how come he's not got a big bloated gut then? Because yeah. he's a fucking power lifter for half the time, so he's learned core control. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. It's core control, without doubt. Why do men's physique spend half their fucking life doing vacuums? Yeah, yeah. So they can make their waist as small as possible. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's all core control. Yeah. And it, the, the easy way to show that is... If that was tissue that's causing that big bulge, yeah. then where does it go when they flex on a forward shot? Yeah. Yeah, I know what you're saying. Where's the tissue going? Yeah. Because if it's going up inside, they're not going to be able to fucking breathe. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to push up against the diaphragm and contract the lungs. It's interesting. I've, I've obviously heard the core thing before, but never put in the way of the, you know, the, the machine use in that sense. It's the, yeah. it's the machine age. We yeah. had this influx of machines that everybody jumps on which is nothing wrong yeah but how when's the last time you saw someone doing a standing overhead press a bodybuilder well yeah <laughs> i can't tell you can't and that takes a lot of core control yeah 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 true even so, squatting's going out the window yeah we've now got squat machines we've now got the v leg v uh, squat we've now got you know pendulum squat yeah which are Excellent machines that activating your leg muscles. They're, they're amazing. Yeah. The the heat you get off them things is brilliant. So why would you squat? Yeah. But the thing is, what you don't realize is by squatting is you learn to control your stomach. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and without doubt, it's core control. Yeah. The other thing potentially is is insulin, but not in the way people think. Insulin allows you to push food in. It allows you to push food through the stomach into the muscle, allows you nutritional transit. Which means you can do a 1,500, 2,000 gram carb, carb load two days before the show. But that's a shitload of food that's going to yeah, sit in your yeah. stomach, push your stomach out. Yeah. So there's the other thing as well. Ridiculously high carb loading in very short period of time instead of spreading it out over four or five days. And what you find is now the trend has moved back towards slow carb loading and the guts are disappearing. Yeah. I'm not – anyone – Run up and down a flight of steps four or five times, so you're fucking proper gasping, yeah. and then take a video of what your belly's doing. Yeah. And then you stand there and say, oh, look at him from when he's posing the back towards the crowd, his belly's stuck right out. Damn right he is. Have you ever posed on stage? It's fucking knackering. <laughs> That's true. You're blowing like a fucking steam engine. That is true. So, yeah, your belly's out because you're going... Because you're fucking trying to get air in. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously a camera doesn't show the movement. It just shows that one moment. And yeah. that's the bit they capture because that's the bit that sells the picture. Yeah. <laughs> just, what, just a quick one, Dave. We, we, we've had spoke to a couple of, of bodybuilders from the 90s and stuff before. And um, when they were doing their, the one might take us over to talk about it on there. But when they were talking about the way that they did their sort of cycles, they used to do like um, the long acting drugs for maybe three weeks and then they'd go on to fast acting for say three or four weeks and then take the period off. What do you think about that? Well, that's just about using drug timing. See, if you finish, 
You do a 12-week cycle on, say, Test and Deca, then you're going to have active hormones in your system, depending on your dose, for two weeks plus. Yeah. Where if you finish your long actors three, four weeks before the end of the cycle and move on to fast actors, then your hormone levels are going to drop very, very rapidly post-cycle. Yeah. Because the half-life has changed. So all it does is stop that tailor off at the end, which means you can get on PCT early, which means your break can be much more controlled. Yes. Instead of having to wait two, three weeks until your esters are starting to drop, then start your PCT. Yeah. And it just drags the whole thing out. Okay. But at the same time, the, the counter argument to that is that, yes, but while your hormones are still high and dropping in that two, three weeks post cycle, you're still enhanced, so you can still train and make progress. Yeah. Yeah. So if you ran 12 week, it's really 14 week because you've yeah. got that two week at the end or three week at the end, you know, it's 15 week. Yeah. So it, it's people use fast actors at the beginning to get on quick or they think they're getting on quick. But what they're actually doing is just super fucking seeding a huge dose of drugs in their system, which turns them toxic right. because slow actors peak in 24 to 36 hours. You right. watch the blood plasma for a shot of test end and it's fucking up there by the next day. Right. Okay. So you don't need to front load. Front load is a lot of bollocks. But you can back load with fast actors so that when you finish, you're, you're off. Right. The okay. only danger with that is that you may then end up coming down from quite a high level of hormones to a very low level of hormones very, very quickly. Okay. While long esters give you a very natural taper. Yes. Because okay. of their half-life. So for an enanthe, every 10 and a half days, you're half in. So you might have a 30-day taper off naturally just from the drug zone half-life. Yeah, yeah. So is there any drugs off season, Dave, that you don't recommend or you think trend. you're wary of? Yeah, okay. Trend. Yeah. yeah. Trend, 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 trend. Yeah, because that's uh, that's quite highly used now, isn't it? In quite that's high- the devil's yeah. own fucking ball of juice. And I'm even reluctant to put it in before a show, but it does have its advantages. There's no denying it. It's a very powerful drug. Yeah. Off season, it should not be touched. Off season should be low impacting from a point of view of stress drugs. So you're looking for drugs with low androgen values, but high anabolic values. Yeah. And then pre-comp, you can bring more androgens in to harden you up and keep you tight and lean. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't know anything like with drugs, particularly myself, but I do know that I never quite understood the trend thing off season because I would have just thought from what I know about it, it'd probably cut appetite and things or the possibility of it. Well, there's, there's the impact on sleep and appetite. Now, some people say I don't get that, but it's still a very toxic drug that's going to stress yeah. your body. And if your body is dealing with physical stress because it's inflamed, it's not using that energy to grow. Yeah. The yeah. healthier and fitter you can be in the off season, the faster you're going to grow. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're why Test and Deca is so popular throughout the ages as an off season drug because te- Deca is a very low impacting drug when it comes to stress on the body. Yeah. So it's yeah. even a fucking anti inflammatory for God's sake. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So if you if they're your sort of your go tos for off season, what would be maybe your go tos then for a pre contest for someone, Dave? Well, depending on who you are and how you respond, because I know a few people grow into diets. Yes. Um, you could potentially look at test test and mast, maybe a bit of anavar, but really what you're doing going into a show is you're just trying to maintain muscle mass. Yes. So it's more about the dieting and possibly the fat burners you're looking at rather than it is about huge amounts of drugs. Yeah, yeah. Tren, tren is useful, lasts three, four weeks. It's a very good hardener and it'll help dry you out and keep you just that bit tighter. Yeah. Um, but generally I'd drop injectables between 12 and 10 days out and yeah. I'd just run, it, run in on orals. If you're super lean, if you are absolutely shredded, I'd actually run in on oxys because you're going to come in full as a fucking house. Okay. But you can only get away with oxys if you are lean. Very, very if you're not lean, you just look a fat fuck. What would be your injectables there? Something like propanate and that type. Yeah, of thing. yeah. I just did, you know, test prop, mass prop, and then yeah. a bit trenase back end of it. That yeah. would be. But I've never been one for using big doses of drugs going into comps, and I've never understood why drugs are elevated going into comp. No, no, yeah. What about the halotestin at the end that people used to use? Yeah, I don't mind Halo. Uh, again, very toxic on the body, not very good for relationships either. Yeah. Uh, um, but it will keep you dry. Yeah. And as long as you're talking sort of last two weeks. What do you think about, Dave? Because I've, I've, I've seen last couple of years where people are using things like letrozole, but they're using it through the entire sort of dieting process and thing, which seems... Crazy to me, but I mean, you know, maybe. Well, 
the, the theory behind it is that the lower your estrogen is, the more you're going to burn fat, the less you're going to store fat, and the less water you're going to hold. So from a competition point of view, you can understand the logic. Yes. The problem with very low estrogen is, one, how you feel on very low estrogen, which is generally not very good. Yeah. And two, estrogen plays a massive role in the liver to support healthy lipids. Yeah. So healthy cholesterol levels. So if you're running letrozole, which is going to, one, smash estrogen, two, reduces HDL anyway, it affects HDL in its own. Yeah. Then, then you're going to probably have a bit of a mess when it comes to your lipids at the end of the cycle in order to sort out. Um, yeah. People underestimate the importance of HDL. Yeah, um, it, it is something that should be brought more to attention and managed more because basically mismanaging HDL at this point is deciding whether you're going to have a heart attack in 10 years' time. Right, okay. Right. HDL is basically a road sweeper. It cleans yeah. your arteries. Yeah. If you haven't got a lot of HDL, you haven't got a lot of road sweepers, your arteries get clogged up. Yeah. They're not going to have an effect in 12 months or two years or three years. It's going to be five years or ten years down the line when those clogged arteries are now going to become a problem. Yeah, yeah. So, I'm, going to, I'm going to have to go very shortly, gentlemen, I'm afraid. Okay, mate. No worries. That's uh, that's great, mate. Is that? We appreciate that. Oh, there were only one more question if you have time for it. Yeah, yeah. No, I've got time for that, but just it's, it's yeah, an hour no, and a half and I'm yeah, just going just, to time. It was just your take, Dave, just to help everybody out, obviously. When they've come to the end of a cycle, what are your recommendations then with things like HCG, you know, et cetera, and things like that? You can't go wrong, really, with Scallies. Uh, Scally's Power PCT has, has had a lot of clinical support to back it up. Now, Scally got written off. He, he's no longer a doctor, um, partly because of his administration of PCT drugs, um, but also he had been a bit naughty in prescribing anabolics to a few people as well. Yeah. <clears throat> but that, that PCT probably has more data behind it than anything else. Now, a lot of people say, well, it's overkill, it's overkill. Well, yeah, maybe it is, but there's not really any harm in that. No. So I would rather go a little bit over and make sure I recover than go a little bit under and have to run a second PCT. Makes sense. Makes so, sense. My go-to would be Scally's. Um, but sometimes you have to be a bit more customized. I mean, if you're on a low dose first cycle or only cycle, you'll probably get away with Novadex or just Clomid and Novadex. Yeah. You start injecting injectables. Even your first cycle of tests, you'd probably still get away with an oral only PCT. Yeah. But when you start having two compounds in and you're into your third and fourth cycles, then you're going to be looking at HCG, Clomid and Novadex in order to PCT. And obviously, Dave, you would highly recommend that people are getting the, the blood checked every month. Oh. Yeah, I mean, I would recommend a full blood works at least once, if not twice a year. Yeah. Generally, I like to do hormone tests three, four, four or five weeks into a cycle, but that only has to be estrogen and prolactin so I can get your management perfectly right. Um, and then, obviously, if you have issues. Um, I mean, the pros that we have on our books with eval generally test themselves every six to eight weeks. Right. And that isn't going to be necessary for a regular person, but these guys are pushing high drugs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so they're being more vigilant. Uh, and at the end of the day, <laughs> prevention is much better than a queer. If you see things starting to change, it, um, uh, you know, and you see values starting to go down in a particularly sensitive area, the sooner you know about that, the sooner you can do something yeah. about it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the reasons my kidneys are as fucked as they are is because the doctors kept telling me my 42 EGFR was fine. Right. It wasn't fine. No, no. <laughs> it was kidney failure. Right. Okay, well, that's, that's brilliant, Dave, is that. Could, no. Would you just like to let us know where people can get hold of you and things like that, just, you know, in case... Right. Right. So, yeah. easy to is probably via Facebook, which is my own name, Dave Crossland. Crossland's your one S. Um, I do also run a blood testing company called Eval, evalbloodanalysis.com. Okay. I do also have a website for my harm reduction, but it's a bit shit and old and needs updating, really, if I'm honest. But that's, <laughs> that's, that's www.crosslands.org.uk. Um, but if people just want to grab me, you're probably best just messaging me through, through Facebook or Instagram. Perfect. Well, that's brilliant, Dave. Thank you so much for that. That's Pleasure. amazing information for everybody, is that, mate? So we'd just like to say a big thank you to Dave Crossland, and we'll see you all again soon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye now.